this segment, I want to um, share with you uh, personal reflections about the wonderful devotion of the Stations of the Cross. And I'm going to eventually get into our particular beautiful Stations of the Cross that we have um, here at St. Clair. Uh, but I'm going to start off talking about the Stations of the Cross as an immersion into what we call the Paschal Mystery. And you hear that phrase a lot at, at Mass. Um, and the Paschal Mystery is entering into the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and the Stations of the Cross are um, uh, an encapsulated version of the Stations of the Cross, if you will. But I want to start by talking about, first of all, a, a pastoral experience of the Stations of the Cross that I encounter um, in my ministry uh, with uh, the people of God. Meaning, I don't think people are aware of how much their life is a living of the Paschal Mystery meaning daily sufferings, daily dyings, and daily resurrections that we encounter in our life. For example, uh, in one particular, in just any day, I'll get one phone call about someone who's um, just really upset about a broken relationship or a divorce, and then an hour later I get a phone call of somebody um, with joyful news uh, about a long-expected pregnancy. And then I go home that evening and I get an email about somebody just distressed about their loved one being deployed um, to war, um, and then the next email um, is some uh, a parent struggling with a, a teenage um, child who's just uh, taking them to their limit, and it's their own sort of a cross in their life. And so people are constantly going through the cycles of suffering, death, and resurrection, and what Christ invites us to do in the Mass and our theology as Catholics is to unite our sufferings, dyings, and risings of discipleship and just even in our day-to-day -day vocation, a life at home, to integrate that into the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we do that um, primarily in the Mass, where we enter into the Paschal Mystery, um, and certain devotions allow us to do that as well. And I think of also, it's similar with the, uh, the devotion of the Rosary. Um, each of those mysteries are allowing us to enter into the mysteries of salvation um, and then applying those to our life um, together. And so I want to reflect on these, uh, on these stations of the cross um, from this pastoral experience and what you're going through in your life. And hopefully that by reflecting on these stations, um, we allow you to make a more spiritual connection to your life and the life of Christ. So I want to give a brief um, historical overview of the Stations of the Cross because um, the 14 that we think of now um, haven't always been there, just like other things in our Catholic traditions that evolved over our 2,000 years. So first of all, the Stations of the Cross began the early Christians um, who marked the places of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. I mean, they also marked other places of his life in the whole Sea of Galilee area. And so they marked um, these places and would have these processions and one of the ways we know about um, the ancient history of this is by this woman, um, Ageria. Now, many people aren't familiar with her, but actually she was kind of a journalist and a pilgrim. And she went to the Holy Land in the like 340 or so, um, fourth century. And she was decided to take a journal and she was gonna share it with her women's faith group back home. And so she wrote down this little experience of everything she saw happening and what was the Christians had uh, their traditions that they had um, been partaking in and rituals um, in the Holy Land. As a matter of fact, uh, she writes down this elaborate um, ritual she witnessed on Good Friday, and much of that um, uh, is exactly what we do on our Good Friday. So Ageria goes and she writes down this journey of she witnessed the Christians making these uh, processions, if you will, this pilgrimage from these various stations of Jesus' um, suffering, death, and resurrection. Um, and so she talks about uh, they begin because the, the, these there were a group of 200 Christians and they were in the Garden of Gethsemane and then they processed over to this big fortress where Pontius Pilate had condemned Jesus and then from there they um, processed to other places along the way and they ended up at this at the Church of uh, the Holy Sepulchre which is the burial site of Jesus so it's Calvary um, and the and the tomb and that was one of the early churches that Constantine built in the fourth century. Um, over the tomb that his mother Helena had found. So now the Christians are processing to this um, site of the Holy Sepulchre um, as well. So that journey is written down by Ageria in a sense as one of the first uh, recorded um, documents on how the Christians had these stations of the cross. Now that eventually, uh, the name of that particular one in the Holy Land was called the Via Dolorosa or the Way of Sorrows and it's still called that um, today.
So then we move forward. So that tradition eventually started evolving. And you may remember St. Francis had a particular devotion to the suffering of Christ, the crucified Christ. And from that, he started um, uh, developing another versions of the Stations of the Cross and taking them to different parts of Europe because St. Francis traveled a lot. So now all of a sudden, a version of the Stations of the Cross um, is evolving in the medieval times, uh, 12th century through uh, St. Francis. Um, and then what starts to happen is that the variety of stations um, keeps evolving as well. So they started out of having seven stations and some places had up to 30 different markings, remembering different experiences that Christ would have had on his way to Calvary. So eventually we end up with um, 14, but the more traditional one was seven. Anyway, long story on numbers there. So St. Francis now promotes it starting through Europe. Now we're into the 15th and 16th century and the Franciscans take over this devotion, if you will, and the Pope gives them permission to now move these outdoor shrines that they've been creating in different towns in their travels and now create little shrines and devotional spaces inside of churches. But that really wasn't until about the 15th, 16th century that we start seeing Stations of the Cross inside of churches as a particular devotion. And by that time, devotion to the saints had already moved inside also with statues of saints, particularly with um, Gothic and uh, Baroque architecture. So now we have the Stations of the Cross in the church and people, now the, the average person, if you will, it becomes a, a regular devotion that is, takes place um, before Mass um, and after Mass. And it was interesting that during those devotional times when these devotions started to be brought into churches, it also was playing out with what, how the development of the Mass was taking place. That when the Mass started going into um, Latin, when people started having a devotional life during Mass. They would play this, pray the Stations of the Cross during Mass, their Rosary, devotion to the saints. Then that happened for uh, you know, centuries. Vatican II comes in and says, we're going to clean this up, make the Mass the Mass, and devotions to the saints and the Stations of the Cross or it should be take place before Mass or after Mass, which is what we're familiar with um, at this point. But that's how Stations of the Cross that we now are familiar with in churches are placed around the perimeter of the church, marking 14 uh, places um, to honor um, the suffering and death of Jesus. As I'm out here in the church, you get a, a little bit of a view of the a bigger picture of the Stations of the Cross that wrap our worship space in an ambulatory that invites um, each person to make that procession um, with Christ um, in the stations. I want to say a little bit about the artists we were so blessed to um, find and select um, for these stations. Her name is uh, Meltem Aktis. She grew up in Turkey and now lives in, in Chicago uh, where we found her. Um, growing up in Turkey, she grew up next to a Greek Orthodox church, but she was raised as a Muslim at first and then she becomes Catholic when she moves to the United States. Uh, Meltem is um, famous for our Stations of the Cross, but she's famous for a lot of other pieces as well, mostly in the Chicago area. Uh, the Jesuits sort of put her on the map when they hired her, commissioned her to do um, a whole series of the life of the Jesuits that are at Loyola University. Um, she redid the interior of uh, the church on the Loyola campus, Maria del Strada there, and several other places, crucifixes and icons throughout Chicago. We were fortunate to find her and commission her to do our Stations of the Cross, where she brings to us her own deep faith um, in addition to her artistic ability. In Melton, when we got together to talk about these, when we, when we were designing the stations with our liturgical design consultant, we really wanted each of the stations to be their own station, their own grotto, if you will, their own prayer space. So in a sense, each station can be its own prayer period because as I said earlier, the Stations of the Cross are meant to help us connect the Paschal Mystery in our life as well. So as you uh, go through the Stations, um, the point is to walk through them slowly, spending time at each Station. Stations are never meant something to get through and it's, you finish with them. You know, like how long, how fast can I get through the Stations of the Cross? No, sometimes you might get to Station number four and it overwhelms you and just stop in that station and just pray with Mary meeting her, um, her child Jesus. Um, so I just invite you as, you as I go through these stations and talk a little bit more about them, I want you to think about them, each of them as not just their own piece of artwork, but each of them as a devotional piece 
that allows each of us to enter into that mystery that Christ is experiencing. Because when I talked with Melton when we were designing these, we wanted each station to be a, a very personal encounter with Christ. So when you go up to each station, notice the emotions on Christ's face. Um, look into his eyes, because in certain stations, he's looking right at you and asking where are you at in your life um, and where are you at in my life. Um, another station, particularly the 14th station, um, Meltem has him painted already in his glorified state. So in certain times you'll see Christ in a very suffering expression, and yet if you also notice that his face is already kind of glorified um, as he places all of his trust in God. So each of the emotions that are evoked in each of the icons are inviting us into Christ's suffering and death, but also his face shows us how to embrace the sufferings of life and remain a person of nonviolence, peace, and forgiveness and trusting in God's will. So when I was visiting with uh, Meltem up in Chicago about um, our vision for these stations, again, she and I agree that we wanted to make each of them a very personal encounter, a personal prayer experience about people's own spiritual journey and their own Paschal mystery. And so, um, first of all, we wanted to create these um, niches um, for the station. And then she talked about uh, influences on her life as well. And two great um, artists that influenced her thinking um, are Giotto, um, who is famous for, he painted most of the frescoes in the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. And the, uh, so that's 14th century. In the 15th century, following him is the um, famous artist Fra Angelica um, in the beautiful monastery um, that he lived in. So we're gonna see an example of that. So I picked three stations that I wanna talk about and reflect on a little bit, kind of from a spiritual perspective and also just kind of from an artistic perspective. So the first kind of unusual one that we have is uh, station number six, and that is uh, Veronica Wipes the Face of Jesus and the beautiful legend of Veronica stepping up um, and wiping his face as he's suffering. And so the first challenge that Meltem had is how do you paint the face of Christ into a piece of linen handkerchief, if you will. And so you're going to see this striking her interpretation of that. So the face of Christ is faded into this uh, linen cloth, so it has a, almost a transparent, um, ethereal, transcendent, uh, transfigured um, appearance, if you will. And I love the way, so he's presented, and of course he's looking right into your eyes um, on the scene. And I, for me, as I reflect on this, those eyes look into your eyes and are saying, thank you for every time that you have wiped the face of one of my suffering ones. Um, every time you've reached out uh, to the imprisoned, uh, the immigrant, the refugee, praying for the unborn, each of those is our way of wiping the face of Christ where we are active in our discipleship. So first of all, there's that beautiful image of how to portray that that she painted. The second thing you'll notice is that the cloth, Veronica's veil, actually comes out of the frame at you. And so again, it's kind of very engaging. So part of the cloth um, hangs over the edge um, of the frame. Then another interesting component of this um, are these hands. Now this is where uh, Giotto and Fra Angelico come into play because Fra Angelico painted these frescoes in the cell of each of his brother um, monks uh, in the monastery. And several of them, he has these hands um, of God. Um, and they're like, for instance, there's one scene of, of Christ facing his uh, uh, rejection and, um, and his death. And there's all these hands that are coming at him with accusations. And that always struck um, Meltman. She wanted to include hands in this. So in this case, um, you can interpret these on various ways. One is the hands of Veronica holding the veil itself. But then also another hand here um, can represent perhaps God reaching down and blessing this veil, blessing Veronica or all those who help the suffering. But also can just be uh, a hand representing um, every disciple who has wiped the face of Christ um, in our works of discipleship. So you got this very uh, uh, amazing and beautiful spiritual movement going on with these hands, um, the spiritual hands of Veronica, the hand of God blessing those who do care for the poor, um, and all of that centered around the very face of Christ looking right into her eyes and blessing us every time we wipe the face of someone who's suffering.
One of the beautiful things uh, Meltem helped us design was within the niches, uh, the beautiful blue, almost an aquamarine uh, blue color that puts the icon in kind of the timelessness of Christ's life um, and the Paschal mystery uh, that kind of just makes it kind of ethereal and, um, and out of this world, if you will, with those deep, deep blue colors. So she and I talked about when she was working on this particular um, scene of the crucifixion, first of all, she talked about how she paints in the old iconography uh, style, and that's layers and layers of the tempera paint. Um, some of these icons have anywhere from 40 to 75 layers um, of, of uh, almost uh, glossy, uh, translucent colors, if you will. And that's where she's able to capture kind of the luminosity of Christ's body, where he's glowing with life at the same time um, of suffering. Now this one, uh, there's not much to say about it because it speaks for itself. But I just want to point out a, a couple of emotions and, and faith experiences for you to uh, possibly encounter when you come to pray in front of this as well. So when we look at Christ, um, again, he kind of um, invites us to enter into his experience. And we see here, of course, the suffering Christ um, as he is um, dying, has died for us. Um, but she paints not in an overly bloody way, even though it was a very bloody experience. She brings in some of the blood components of it and the suffering with the crown of thorns. Um, but it also represents this faith experience that he must have been going through. And again, the icon invites us to have a faith experience as well when we're going through suffering. So if you look closely um, at his face, and again, kind of the glowing of the body, there's a couple things. Um, one is, first of all, again, his ultimate stance of nonviolence. As people were rejecting him, beating him, spitting on him, he is in a posture of nonviolence, very important for us in our times. And in that connected, you see a sense of serenity, like turning over his life to God and God's will and accepting this path of his, that this suffering he knows is going to lead to resurrection. That means so much to us when we're going through our own um, suffering. When I look at this, I also look into his face and I just see this, um, that trust in God. You know, we have the beautiful divine mercy where we say, Jesus, I trust in you. And here I picture Jesus saying, as he did, um, Father, I trust in you, as he totally trusted that the Father was going to take his body and rise it up on the third day. So we see his faith, his trust, um, his nonviolence, and there's also just kind of a, a serenity, a peacefulness, um, that in the midst of suffering, when one has a deep faith and trust in God, they also have kind of a, a serenity that in the suffering, I trust and know God is going to carry me through this to some place of resurrection. And trusting God through our suffering, through our own crosses in life, the crosses of discipleship, um, really requires a deep faith. And this particular station invites us into Christ's suffering, but also to sit with it and deepen our own faith and trust in God and God's will for our life. I was uh, fascinated to learn in talking to Meltem about the design of these, that each of these icons um, took anywhere from three to six months each to create um, the design because she has to create uh, you know, the pencil cartoon um, and then the planning of it. Um, each of the actual uh, state, uh, wood that the icons are painted onto are handcrafted by a carpenter as well. Uh, and then the primer and then uh, the 24 karat gold leaf uh, and then the actual painting um, begins. So when we were creating these, um, designing the plan, knowing that they were going to take three to six months each, um, we spaced them out um, and they, uh, I think they were finished in um, maybe four years before the final one was installed. So j they really just came in one by one. And she goes, well, which one should we start with? And I said, you know, the one I want to start with um, is station number 13. And where Mary is holding the body of her deceased son. And I said that because um, one of the most emotional and difficult pastoral ministries for me is counseling and helping parents who have lost a child. And this image um, in the 13th station um, is certainly meant to capture, I wanted to capture that most tragic uh, experience in a person's life 
when a parent loses a child. And so I kind of wanted to start with that emotional experience and the beauty of this particular um, station. So this is a very unique um, take on what we call the Pieta, uh, Mary holding uh, the dead body of her son Jesus. And I want to point out a few things about it that is so meaningful to me and I invite you to um, pray it as well. So again, the first thing I wanted to capture was the grief that a parent goes through. A, a parent who's lost a child literally in death, but also a parent who suffers with uh, a rebellious teenager, um, an adult child dealing with an addiction, um, a, a child who's in prison, um, all the different griefs that a parent goes through throughout the time of raising their children. So it's meant to capture um, many experiences that our parents feel, and she's able to even put in some teardrops coming from Mary's eyes. Um, and Mary looks right into our eyes. Even if we're not a parent, she looks at us for times when we have had to hold some version of death. Maybe it's the death of a dream, the death of a loved one, the death, the death of, of a relationship. Um, so she represents every time we lose something. So it's a real icon of grief. So as we see her tears coming out of her eyes, she's looking right at us as a consoling mother. As Jesus gives her to us, says, behold your mother, he says from the cross. Now if we follow down, first of all, um, she's dressed as a kind of a Middle Eastern woman, which is what she would have been done with, a, with her head covering and her head wrapping. Um, so that would just be of the time period, if you will. Um, traditional blue um, for Mary, but also um, I think when we captured this, we also wanted her to represent women of all nations because many women do wear um, head, head coverings. Um, and so she represents all women, particular women living in cultures whose children die regularly, women who are in um, some form of, of, of oppression. So she represents this international woman with um, her headdress um, as well. Then follow her arm down in her hand, beautifully, very feminine hand, points us to look at the wound of Christ where he's been crucified. So she as a mother says, follow his wounds, enter into his suffering with your suffering as well. As she is united with his suffering, she invites us to be united too. So her hand wraps that way. Meanwhile, Christ has resolved um, and uh, given up his body for the salvation of the world. So his face is pointing down at us um, in our sufferings as well. She's looking at us into her eye. And then if you follow his hand, his hand is actually pointing upward, sort of towards her face. And he's inviting her to look into her face as our mother. And she, of course, is the mother of the church. So he's saying, look to her discipleship, her faithfulness. And she, as mother of the church, says, always follow her example of discipleship, where he's saying to us with his hands, I need you now to care for one another in grief and carry on the ministry and mission that I've given to you. So we have all of this beautiful um, symbolism of, of grief, of discipleship, of faithfulness, um, of this motherly care, where she says to us, I am here as your mother, and I'm here to care for you. And through my son's suffering, together, um, we unite um, ourselves in our belief in the resurrection. One of the great joys and privileges I have of presiding up here in the sanctuary um, is that my view during the Mass um, is not only your prayerful um, faces, um, but the Stations of the Cross um, wrap our praying um, at every Mass. And that's my view why I'm praying. So it's very powerful for me to be embraced with this story of Christ's um, Paschal Mystery while I'm leading us um, in the Paschal Mystery prayer um, of the Mass. So as I talk about this devotion and wrap up now, um, oftentimes we associate Stations of the Cross with the season of Lent, which is true and it's a popular devotion during then. I'm inviting you to consider um, the Stations of the Cross devotion more regularly in your life. Because as I said, these are, uh, they capture our own spiritual journey um, with Christ on the journey. Because at times when you're, when you're in front of one of the stations, notice how uh, Christ is walking um, with you in your own cross, whatever you're going through. And at the same time, each of the icons invite you into it where we are walking with Jesus on his journey as well. So it's a real accompanying experience by praying these devotions that I'm encouraging you um, to do. Because sometimes we can feel like Simon, 
um, who, um, when we've been called to help someone else carry the cross and sit by their bedside when they're suffering or visit them in prison, we are the Simon. And sometimes we just need to sit with that station for a while. Uh, sometimes uh, we need to just sit with uh, the station of Jesus falling for the third time because we wonder the third time we have fallen in a, a sinful habit, an addiction, um, some other new suffering in our life. We wonder, how could I possibly get up from this? And I just need to sit with the third station and be with Jesus and he's with me as what feels like I'm falling for the third time. So each of the stations are very praying experience where we can encounter, uh, go into the encounter with Christ and he with us. When it comes to the mass, um, the reality is, is that uh, the whole Stations of the Cross is captured in, uh, in the book of the Gospels, the very life of Christ, which is why we process around this with great reverence. So every time you see this opened up um, on the Sunday Mass, um, we're opening up the Stations of the Cross of Jesus' Paschal Mystery in here. And from the Liturgy of the Word, we move to the Liturgy of the Altar. And at the altar is the ultimate prayer of celebrating and remembering Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. Because here we empty ourselves with Christ, we go into his death, and then in the Eucharist we rise with him to new and everlasting life. So I, my prayer is that this devotion of the Stations of the Cross will enrich your own spiritual journey, deepen your friendship and relationship with Christ, and let Christ, invite Christ to be more and more deeply involved in your own Paschal mystery, your own way of the cross to the resurrection.